Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. One of the most important hours of the week is our preparedness, civil defense, uh, earth changes, pandemic, flu, Fukushima update, and earth changes, as well as the surveillance state. And, of course, is the hour where we often talk about uh, releases of information from inside the government, classified information, etc., that you need to know. Our panel of uh, specialists, John Moore, who is a forensic investigator, former Special Forces, a prepper expert and consultant, so if you need to be prepped up, he's the guy to contact. Uh, Ann Morrison, our scientist dealing with earth changes, uh, pandemic flu, uh, space weather, UV light, uh, all kinds of different topics, amazing. And, of course, uh, Professor... James McCanny, who will be calling in today, we have all three. Uh, first, let's start off with uh, John, who I think has been on the road. So, John, what's your latest update? And then we'll hear from Ann and Professor McCanny. Okay, this will be quick. Thank you, Dr. Daigle. Uh, one of our fellow radio talk show hosts, Mr. Dave Hodges, he's on Republic Broadcasting. He's written a series of three articles. There may have been a fourth one today, published the 17th, 18th, 19th. I don't know if there's one today or not at his website. The Common Sense Show, The Common Sense Show. Uh, Dr. Deagle, when you read his articles, you'll find them to be a very concise summary of the things you and I have been talking about for most of this past year. Uh, and he has a, a list of sources that are every bit as good as mine, if not better, uh, feeding him information about the foreign troops, the Russians, what FEMA and DHS are up to, and so forth. So I, I think uh, I'm going to recommend everybody go to uh, the Common Sense Show website, the Common Sense Show. Read his articles he published, 17th, 18th, and 19th. There may be one today. I don't know yet. I've been on the road. And I think that you'll get a lot of uh, good consolidated information that you can work with and move forward with. Now, to summarize what we've talked about over the last number of weeks, for those who are new, uh, you brought out documents which I'm aware of because I worked with Delta Force uh, back in the mid-90s when I was one of the head security clearance to work with them in the Federal Center. I worked with the federal government on Operation Top Off and Dark Winter. And for those people who are novices who don't understand this, and, and basically most radio hosts except for yourself and myself haven't been on the inside, we have. <clears throat> so when we say these things, we say them with authority that there are foreign troops on American soil at any one time is anywhere from 600,000 to 1.2 million foreign troops being trained with weapons and tactics on American soil, and that's not new. That's been happening even before the fall of the Soviet Union back in uh, the late 1980s. What's happening is, <clears throat> under the Obama administration, there's been uh, integration with European uh, satellite security systems. Uh, there's been uh, foreign troops trained from the former CIS nations of the Soviet Union. And uh, many of these troops are on American soil right now. Many of them That's have right. actually they been are. here for the more last than 20 years. Right, and more, many of them have actually integrated. They have families that have gotten married here. They have businesses here. Their kids have gone to college here. Uh, we're talking about basically sleeper agents, and just like Absolutely. in East Germany. They look like and, us. They talk <clears> like us. You can't tell the difference. Now, the point that I, I want to make here is, is really important, is uh, they, the policy of the federal government is they know there's a break point coming at some future date. We're not going to set dates, but there's anywhere from two to six million Americans that they call the hard resistors that basically will completely resist whatever the government's going to try to do. Now, that's only the tip of the spear because altogether there's 94 million armed Americans. 27 million of them are veterans that have all kinds of skill sets. The rest are hunters that have other skill sets that go to gun clubs, etc. Uh, there's half a half a billion guns in this country. That's right. a lot. <clears throat> and the fact is that they can't disarm Americans unless they do one of several things. There's not a long list. An airborne plague, number one. Uh, coronal mass ejection, which the government can do because they don't want to wait until, quote, one happens from the sun because it's very unpredictable. Even with all their all right. fancy satellites and tier one science, they can't say if there's a big major sun uh, burst, there was one a few months ago, that missed the Earth by, you know, a number of Earth's diameters, but if it had hit us, it would have been a Carrington-style event. And people need to understand that Carrington event would happen in 1859, uh, roasted r uh, railway ties, they actually went railway ties on the railways, went on fire, that there were telegraphers' desks and hands of the telegraphers actually were burned. Uh, <clears throat> we have also, <coughs> we have a, if that happened today, our entire civilization would completely crash. And we, and we wouldn't just lose our power um, and our satellites. We wouldn't just lose our power transmission lines. We'd lose all our computing systems, all our water control systems, which have electronic control systems. Most of our vehicles, which are not hardened against this, the, the newer ones that have integrated circuits. Uh, so we'd have a really big problem. Um, we would. We would, yeah. Dr. Deagle. That's a good summary of yourself. 
Um, uh, you've got uh, a couple of guests fighting here, Dan and, and, and Jim McCanning. I'm going to jump out of here and let you guys uh, finish up the show, and, and it's good to be with you. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. Uh, we want to hear from Ann next, and then we're going to hear from Professor McCanning. And believe it or not, I already have a question. Uh, from uh, Tommy in Memphis, but we, when we have people with questions, whether it's during this hour or any other hour, we need the specific question, details of one or more questions in exact details or, and or statement so that the board op can post that up. Uh, that's really important because they screen all of those before they get on. No one gets on without being screened. Um, and you have a lot of numbers of the things to talk about. We have the H1N1 flu that's now shown them not only in Montgomery County, Texas, but also showing up in Portland, Oregon. It's the uh, H1N1 DMP09 strain, and it's killing people pretty quickly. Apparently, in Montgomery County, though, several of the people that died, they can't find the virus, so they think there may be another organism like mycobacteria. Um, <clears throat> we have a... Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> so we have a... Uh, a situation where uh, that's going on. Then, we, of course, we have Fukushima Daiichi, where we talked about this and got on e, &E News yesterday with uh, Chris Harris about the fuel rod assemblies. By yesterday, they had pulled 88 of 1,533 bundles. Uh, some of the last ones were bent, like the banana, and we were pretty sure that the fuel rod assembly uh, pellets came out and fell out into the pool, the pool itself. No evidence yet that the uh, cooling pool uh, seal is leaking, but it's only a matter of time. These structures are leaning, they have inclinometers on them. They're all going to fall into this mush we call this oatmeal nuclear mush that they're creating with all the water around. And of course, it's the rainy season and there with snow and everything. <clears throat> so um, it's only a matter of time. We have a death a spiral happening in the Western Pacific Ocean with 3,000 nautical miles, almost 4,000 miles of the ocean's dead. And if you go 150 miles off the coast of California, 98% of the seafloor is covered with dead sea life. Uh, most people don't realize they're already being poisoned today. So I tell people, don't freak out. Start taking Nutrameds. Get a radiation detector. Be aware when the radiation levels are higher. Start thinking of your home as a hazmat site. Start realizing you may need to shutter inside and filter your air and take specific nutraceuticals uh, to protect yourself. So um, can, you, uh, can you give us some updates on what's going on with the flu? The H7N9, we are now starting to uh, quarantine people in China. Uh, the H1N1 flu and others because uh, beta coronavirus is spreading. Uh, we're going to have 2014 is going to be quite a year. It's, and of course, the government is just seething for a crisis so that they can bring in a bank holiday, <clears throat> a martial law, which I expect to happen at the very least, a bank holiday for five to, days to uh, two weeks. I expect a devaluation of the currency. I expect Japan to collapse this next year. Uh, their economy and a run on the, on the bond market because of what the courts have been doing there. And of course, we have uh, <clears throat> continued weird activity on the sun, which Professor McKinney will update. So, and what's going on in Earth's changes and what's happening in these other areas? Well, it, it, the situation in Houston, around Houston, is, is very dramatic. And uh, they came into it after the fact. In other words, people had died before they got to the testing phase. They, they were just classifying them under ILI, which is influenza-like uh, illness. And, uh, you know, and if, they're, if the test didn't work, then they just assumed that there was something else that caused a flu. And uh, so people died without, being, without the uh, particular virus being identified. They now have identified two people with the uh, H1N1 PDM09 virus. And there is another case. There is yet another case. But now there are 15 cases. Uh, six died so far, and there are. So that means there's eight critically ill. Yeah. This thing is spreading around Houston. It's in three counties now, and uh, it, the transmission is. Uh, it's up also in. It's up also in in, in the area uh, around Austin, Texas, too. Oh, it's down in Austin now, too. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it's in Austin. It may well be this virus or others, but uh, the report is in Austin that uh, several individuals have died. Uh, actually, I think Alex Jones's uncle, Rob Dew, has been sick, and I think it's probably this virus or. Come back and uh, so and uh, we've got three areas uh, to discuss. Uh, the first is, of course, the pandemic flu. 
Uh, the pandemic mycobacteria, pandemic uh, beta coronavirus, H1N1, H5N1, H7N9, and there's also an H7N7 as well out there. I think that 2014 is going to be thought of as the year of the flu. Um, and it's interesting that uh, comets are often harbingers of major flu pandemics. It was a major cometary uh, period of time right before the 1918 uh, swine flu. <clears throat> and then I expect Fukushima Daiichi to get a heck of a lot worse than it is now. They're not going to be able to ignore it, despite the fact they put a cap on and they called and the enemies of the state to even ask questions about Fukushima with the uh, totalitarian state of Abe, which I'm calling for a revolution against this government. We need a call for it now, and Americans, we need to stand up and say, the Japanese people don't need to be victims of these fools. We need reality, and we need scientists to use their best brains to figure out a way to uh, to clear this and stop this problem, because whatever's happening in Japan now is going to hit the West Coast of the United States. It's going to go over the entire United States. It's going to hit most of the Northern Hemisphere. And despite uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the scientists thinking that this is going to be restricted to the northern hemisphere it won't peak as high but it will eventually peak in the southern hemisphere they'll receive a good dosage of radiation there plus the danger of chernobyl type reactions and fukushima type reactions of other reactors all over the planet especially if there's a war or terrorism the primary target if i was a terrorist would be a nuclear power plant and its waste depot so i think that we need to solve this problem and fukushima should be a wake-up call that old style nuclear reactors need to be removed and uh, we need to start looking at other ways of generating energy, including tokamak fusion reactors, uh, thorium, uh, pebble bed reactors developed in South Africa, and other technologies such as Professor McCanny's energy from the torsion field, which is the, if you want to call it the Higgs field, that actually generates and creates the gravitonic effects that create planets and stars. Those fields exist before the planets and stars even are formed. And uh, <clears throat> there's really no li limit in energy. It's it's like the uh, Buckminster Fullerite uh, theory. You know, Buckminster Fuller talked about the tremendous intelligence of the universe, the tremendous energy of the universe. Uh, you know, and his genius actually explained what Professor McKenney is talking about, which is the completion of Nikola Tesla's work uh, that basically shows that deficiencies are all created in the minds of the global maniacs that want to tell us that science can't solve these problems, including subatomic particle physics, to alter the half-life of radioisotopes or there isn't, there's limited energy, or you have to always pollute when you create energy. So, and let's get into this stuff about uh, the flu, because I think 2014, if people aren't taking our nutraceuticals, protecting themselves against radiation, having detectors, etc., they're going to be caught really uh, in big trouble. Well, that's right. Um, we've had one plume that has come over from, uh, that was in March of uh, 2011, after the uh, Nukushima, the Fukushima accident, and uh, it spread radiation around, uh, mainly across the top of the country and into the northeast and uh, the bottom part of Canada. And some of it did go down the coast, though, and the, the French in particular have been very good about monitoring that and, and showing the, uh, the trail of the plume that came across from the jet stream. It only took that plume to come across, it only took like three to five days for radiation to reach the west coast of the United States from Japan. Are you then talking about the French? You mean you're talking about the French in, in France? You mean they're monitoring it too? It was a French company. Yeah, well, the French government sent over. You know, they've got all these nuclear reactors, and they were interested. So they they uh, looked at the data and they collected data, and they said, "Hey, you've got mm -hmm. serious contamination problems all along the west coast, and then across the bottom part of Canada." Yeah, there's pictures right. of it. Okay, then. Um, and then now we have radioactive, radioactive debris that's washing up on the um, northern shores of California and the shores of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. In, this, right. for, in some cases, it is radioactive, and I hope the people that are dealing with it. The federal government said, no, we're not going to help. This is, well, they're this actually going to be forced to. Now, the, the, the city of Berkeley, which is the University of Berkeley, uh, where the Department of Engineering uh, Physics is actually was monitoring for a year and a half, and they stopped, by the way, after I contacted their director and said, well, we need more information directly because they're doing a really good job of reporting water and food. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they did, somebody must have threatened them, uh, most likely from government or corporations or the nuclear industry. Uh, but the city of Berkeley is now going to push the state and have their own private health officers and do testing. So Berkeley, California. Yeah, I just saw that, that they uh, passed it through the city council. 
And uh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, if the federal government isn't going to step up and the state government is going to step up and the county government is not going to step up, then you have to step up as a city. And, of course, they're particularly vulnerable because they are a tourist attraction and a uh, university, uh, uh, international, internationally known university. So uh, they're particularly vulnerable because well, people aren't going to well, want to go where there's radiation. They have to well, say, hey, well, we're, what, we're measuring it. We're, we're active here. What do you think of these different flus? Because we're now, you can narrow count on one hand, all the major flu strains are all now spreading very fast, and some of them are getting quite lethal. This H1N1 DPM09 uh, is infecting and killing people pretty quickly, and it has the characteristics that if it, in the next, say, six weeks or eight weeks, if it continues its current pace, it's going to become a pandemic flu. Uh, it'll well, first be epidemic and then pandemic. Apparently, the, there were very variants, they call it variants, of the influenza virus, the AH1N1 PDM09, and they were detected in Taiwan between 2012 and 2013. So, uh, and what they said was that if, because of these variants that uh, are seen in, in this and also in the H3N2 virus, that uh, you're not going to be able to, uh, to identify them with your testing. And that's what happened in uh, around Houston. I bet, if they did clay, I bet if they did clade analysis, they'd find the strains were the same ones as, as Taiwan are very similar, because most people don't realize that the long flights, say the Dreamliner and the major trans-Pacific flights, uh, starts in Taiwan and goes to Houston, Texas. Its primary airports are L.A. and Houston. So uh, it's not surprising that it emerged in Houston. Okay. And... Um, so, so they knew about this um, early in 2013, but they didn't update their testing. So in other words, mm. you know, <laughs> so, well. so they're still trying to detect it with testing that they know won't detect it. Oh, come on, guys, give me a yeah, break. <laughs> it's being, um, well, this is not acceptable incompetence. Um, what, what's also happening in terms of earthquake, volcanoes, and uh, unusual weather because we're seeing weird, uh, basically not normal air weather patterns, Highs and lows. We know that oh, the plasma yeah, physics is Professor it. Professor McCanny talked about that weather is caused by plasma physics, and he mentioned a few unusual um, M class CMEs, but they created a lot of ultraviolet light. Uh, as we'll get Professor McCanny's analysis of that, but I'm very suspicious that uh, it was the plasma discharge, not the UV light, that triggered off these weird weather storms. It wouldn't surprise me. There's been at least it'll be the third um, extremely strong, extremely, extreme ultraviolet flash that came out of a flare. The first one uh, affected the uh, high on um, tornado, not tornado, <laughs> typhoon. The high end uh, cyclone, yeah. Ty yeah typhoon, high end typhoon. Yeah, over a, a, that hit uh, into, Indone into the Philippines. The second one created uh, a cyclone of Cleopatra in the Mediterranean Sea. In the Mediterranean yeah. Sea, we had a we had a cyclone. That's and the weird. The third one just hit two days ago, and we're wow. I'm expecting wild weather. We'll hear more from Professor McKinney when we come back. <clears throat> back and. Uh... We have uh, Professor McCandy going to give us some technical details. And, uh, you know, this is very important that scientists listening to this because it's a new paradigm of what weather is. If you're a, uh, a weatherman or weather woman, or if you're a, uh, an expert in, in what we call near Earth space weather, space weather connects directly to our weather. In fact, our weather is just an expression of the plasma physics of space weather. Uh, the transfer of plasma that occurs with an AMRX class solar flare. And you mentioned before the break, Anne about yep. the UV light striking the eastern Mediterranean around the area that created this uh, cyclone, uh, Cleopatra, that, that, that smashed into Sardinia. Uh, Professor McCanny, what are the best websites and what's the best explanation of what's going on? Because uh, I think extreme weather is just going to be the, 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 uh, the average nowadays. We, we don't have the normal solar heating by more sunspots. We have plasma physics causing extreme weather. It's very unpredictable. Uh, we see, for example, we talked about this last night, that there's a giant wall that I think is artificially created that prevented the wall of the cyclone that it arrived around from South China Sea that would have brought a lot of radioactive isotopes from, from near Kamchatka and Japan all the way to North America. It hit that wall and dissipated north and south and never hit the coast of California. 
So um, I think there's some weather modification going on, weather warfare. Uh, five nations of weather modification technology, America and Russia being the most advanced. France, Britain, and I believe there's another nation, uh, China. And um, the um, situation on the Eastern Mediterranean is a good example of, to explain your physics, which is verifiable, and you can actually, as an armchair uh, astronomer and weather person, uh, you can actually start to kind of say, oh, this is what I could see. This is what's likely happening because of the plasma physics of M or X class flares, and the plasma physics is what drives weather. Uh, yeah, the the situation uh, is, uh, the UV light blast that we're seeing out of the sun. Uh, you can think of them as a light bulb. When they go off, that UV light is going in basically 360 degrees. If you were off to the side of that or off to any point uh, in space looking at the sun, you would also see that uh, that blast equally strong. Uh, in other words, it's not like a laser beam. But what's coming out with that is a beam of charged particles, protons primarily, uh, probably at relativistic speed. So they're coming, they, they're hitting about the same time as the light gets to us. And uh, in this particular case, my estimate of what happened is the blast actually went by Earth. And as Earth then moves into that, that streamer, we discharge it, and that's where the activity comes from to power these storms. And there's always the possibility in something like this, too, that we've had a little help from our friends, like you say, with weather control. And uh, why this, uh, uh, you know, it's hard without real data to point the finger at either natural causes or artificial causes. But remember that in an artificial weather control scenario, that all they're doing is providing a trigger mechanism for energy that's already there. They're not creating the energy for the storm system. They're exactly. In other words, what they're, yeah, in other words, it's, the energy is already there. They create basically a uh, electromagnetic uh, rail, if you want to call it, for the energy to be concentrated in storm cells. Is that right? That's exactly correct. And they do that. The, the current best way to do that is with lasers, where you ionize the air path that gives a good conduction path, and uh, therefore you basically, like I say, it's a trigger mechanism to release the energy from the ionosphere that's already there. Uh, right. But then that's the same mechanism that happens naturally when a cloud system forms above a storm system. It's like an electrical finger pointing up in space, and that is where the electrical discharge begins. And once that discharge begins, it wants to flow we have enormous amount of electrical energy pent up capacitance uh, like a battery in the upper ionosphere. And so this all starts to flow down that one tube. And so, in other words, powering this, these cyclonic storms. Uh, but um, that's my estimate of what happened. And you were asking, where do we see, where could an amateur see the activity? And uh, basically, if you look for the infrared satellite data, or the uh, what's known as radar. I'm not talking about the ground-based Doppler. I'm talking about the satellite radar, which identifies water and temperature. And so what you look for is the concentration of water. Uh, I just went through this on a recent show where, for example, we have tremendous water systems developing in the middle of the United States. And uh, typically the water in storm systems comes off the Pacific Ocean or the Gulf swoops up over land and we can see that water moving in the radar, the satellite radar and in, in the infrared. So we can see that water moving in. It, then the cloud systems form due to the vertical electric field and the storm systems develop. But there's sometimes there is no water movement in from the Gulf or the Pacific. And all of a sudden we've got 11 inches of rain falling in the middle of a city someplace or out in the country. And the question is, well, where did that water come from? It came from outer space uh, because we connected into a vein of water, basically, uh, and Earth is acting as a comet, drawing in uh, the, the Earth's upper atmosphere is charging. And if you wanted to imagine a picture, I actually have a picture of this in my weather book, but you could imagine a leech connected to the side of a fish. 
and that's kind of what it looks like in outer space. It's connected. It's a plasma influx of plasma that's coming in from outer space, connects to the upper atmosphere, and these have been measured for decades. We have had pictures of these in the ultraviolet coming into the atmosphere for decades where they see the water coming in. Uh, and along with that is the electrical discharge, and that goes all the way down to ground through the, the storm system. So that's kind of a uh, back of the envelope quick explanation of the, the order of the process. But basically, none of this would happen. In fact, we wouldn't even have clouds if it, if it were not for the solar electric field that we live in. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. It also means that uh, solar sunspot activity and UV light don't drive weather. It's the plasma discharges that steer the storms. What I've been told, and you can corroborate this uh, or modify it, is that when they set up the storm cells that pulled in and formed Katrina or the sandy uh, winter storm that caused destruction up around New York, New Jersey, they actually, what they did is set up what's called a uh, upper atmosphere torsion field that pulled in the storm cells over a period of days to create this giant vortex. And when enough storm cells pulled in, they actually created the storm and they could steer it around like a joystick. So they can put relatively minimal energy in there. They actually, in a sense, actually steer the storm cells to create a, a weather pattern, if you want to call it. Yeah, well, well, just imagine this. They're in the North Atlantic, like in the case with Sandy, or another wonderful case is what they call the perfect storm. That was in uh, 1991, the fall of 1991. Three overland hurricanes formed eventually out in the North Atlantic to form one superstorm where the eyes met and joined together. Or in the case of Sandy, which was definitely a manipulated storm. Uh, but basically, yeah, the once the storm forms, then uh, the standard story of, of meteorology is that the hurricanes are formed over warm water. Well, there's no water, warm water in October in the North Atlantic. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so absurd. It's beyond absurd. Uh, but uh, clearly they know how to manipulate storms. And I actually made a measurement one time. I was in a flight over the Pacific Ocean, and I was able to take photographs of the laser pulsing. And uh, uh, Yeah, the laser pulsing, the, you're talking about the laser pulsating, they heat up the upper atmosphere and start steering the storm cells. Yeah, and what it does is it, it ionizes an air path, and an ionized air path, as you may well imagine, is a good conductor. The right. standard atmosphere is a dielectric, and it's a very good insulator electrically. And that's why we don't have uh, uh, current flowing down. That's what harbors all that energy, that electrical energy, up in the upper atmosphere. But when the path is broken, and this is what Tesla was doing, uh, so let's uh, talk about that a little bit, too. What Tesla was doing with his Tesla tower was drilling through that the, di the dielectric of the atmosphere to then drain the energy down to his tower to collect it and distribute it for free. Wow. Back in a moment. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. Welcome back. And uh, no, Professor McKinney, what, what you're saying is pretty day. remarkable. It means that a lot of the uh, information that's publicly put out is particularly uh, incorrect. Uh, you have an interesting story we'll hear later about one of your friends that actually did some things about posting some information and saw that the government even can target what they want what they want to post on his screen. Um, what this means that you're describing is there really is no limit for energy, which is the primary, if you want to call it, currency of the planet. It's not gold or silver, which is the best second substitute. It's certainly not electronic currency or Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is the biggest what I call scamtastic scheme. If you want to invent something that's very nasty, it would be Bitcoin. Uh, the next is, of course, the current system, which is based on funny money printed out of thin air and the biometric currency that's talked about in the Bible called the mar biometric mark of the beast. Uh, the best currency in the world is one where basically everybody can get access to free energy, uh, that it's available and you can store it uh, and you can utilize it to create goods, to create food and not to have pollution. Uh, it would change the whole world. It would, it would be a complete change because we now have what we call relatively free information, which is going to continue to exponentially increase. And the culture is already eroding uh, the differences between different cultures, you know, labels like communist Chinese, Western countries, 
socialist, capitalist. And a lot of people are, right now we have the birth pangs, I call it the egg tooth of the little chick inside the, the shell of our current cultures all around the planet, poking through and saying it's time to break out of the shell and for human beings to have new levels of technology that will release us to use our imagination, to not have a polluted world, to have life extension technology, to, uh, to not have strong independent nations rather than a globalist bunch of control freaks that ball off tier one science and uh, from tier two, and also uh, to f have us as a planet start to work together as nations to protect our planet from nearer space objects and space weather that can be very dangerous. But we don't see, um, at least publicly, any moves. If there is anything behind the scenes, it's completely walled off. And during Obama's administration, they basically made NASA go complete black op. Uh, to me, that's very disgusting. And, nothing, and Obama has nothing to be proud of. Everything from his Obamacare to NASA going black op, this man is just plain stupid and evil. Uh, yeah, well, uh, what we were talking about on the break was the fact that uh, the storm systems are powered from above, from ionic currents, or currents from the ionosphere. But understand, they can't allow that in meteorology to be known because then people would start to get the idea of exactly what I've been saying my revival of Tesla's work, that the energy is, uh, we have the ability and knowledge to grab that energy, and there's enormous amounts of energy. There's enough energy in a hurricane to power our country for a year. And well, in fact, uh, the, very, the very systems that they have developed to weaponize the planet and the weather, I say weaponize Earth, are the very systems that uses Tesla's real secret weapons, his real discoveries, which you talk about and explain like no one else, you're the originator of all this, that explains, in fact, what Tesla really developed. And the government weaponized it rather than making energy available to people. They have toxic nuclear reactors, the use of what they call fossil fuels. There's no such thing as fossil fuels. They're abiotic fuels that come from deep in the earth because it's a nuclear reactor. Um, and all, all uh, basically oil, all petrochemical products have some levels of heavy metals and radioisotopes. That's why off the coast of New Orleans, Alabama, they had tar balls that were full of thorium, strontium, uranium, etc. They were radioactive. And uh, people don't want to believe that. It's too bad. It's just the facts. It's scientific facts. Yeah. So it's not open for dispute. And uh, I, I what you're, you're doing here is you're, you're offering an option to that, that no one else on Earth has offered that literally says they've walled off science and it's killing people and killing the planet. Absolutely. I wanted to add to Anne's comments there were you and yours about the the pollution of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the, the food chain cycle, uh, and this happens, a good example is mercury. Uh, the fish that are larger have higher concentrations of mercury, and it's disproportionate, it's exponential with their size. And so what's happening in the Pacific Ocean is that the plankton filters the water like once a week the, the plankton of the pacific ocean filters the water all of that radioactivity is going into plankton and then it's consumed all the way up the food chain up to the largest mammals with the whales and so what we're going to have is all of the animals i saw a study done by these uh, uh, uh what is it the Spix uh, uh uh oceanographic institute in california which is a big government misinformation engine, and they said, oh, there's no problem, it'll just dissipate in the ocean. Well, it completely ignores the fact that there's a food chain out there, which is right. starting with <clears throat> plankton, filtering that water on a constant basis and driving it into the life out there. Uh, all of the food chain up the food chain lives in, in a sense off that plankton. It's the base of the food chain, so all of the life in the Pacific Ocean is going to be irradiated and killed off uh, in the near future. And we're not seeing that. There's no studies being done. And we have the top uh, institutes. The, the well, we have some. We have some reports from. Said. We have some reports from people that sail typically from from Okinawa and from Japan all the way to San Francisco. We reported this on rents. Uh, we have reports also of people that have actually been going down and diving 150 miles off the California coast, and they're seeing 98% of the seafloor covered by dead animals. Um, there's, there's a lot of really bad things going to happen. And when this major plume of radiation strikes us with strontium and cesium, you're going to see a massive die-off of, uh, 
these organisms, and of course it's part of what I call the lungs of the planet. The 80% of the oxygen in the world is created by the upper 30, meter, 30 feet or 10 meters of the ocean surface, the skin of the ocean actually creates most of the oxygen on Earth by converting carbon dioxide to the phytoplankton, <clears throat> which means we're going to get a case of chronic lung disease as a planet. Uh, every time you turn your car on, your SUV or your vehicle, even if it's a hybrid, you're burning the byproduct of phytoplankton. And uh, once there's not enough phytoplankton, uh, the human beings on the planet may require oxygen concentrators, not just like if they have COPD, but in their home, to have adequate levels of oxygen in their workplace or their building. So the future of possible dome cities, if we don't smarten up, is very real by the later parts of this 20th century, if we don't stop doing what we're doing. Yeah, nuclear disaster uh, was imminent. It was inevitable. And uh, now it's happened. Uh, Chernobyl was bad, but the, the Japanese radiation situation is is horrific, and it's not going to end. It's just beginning. It's we're, You know, we, yeah, no, we're just seeing the beginning of it. I'm going to ask a, 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 a subatomic particle physics question. Um, I've heard from some reports from various, like, uh, there's some scientists that say that, that you could use specific types of harmonic radiation, like Tesla talked about with Madame Curie over 80 years ago, and you could actually change the T1 half of radioisotopes and actually cleanse the water using broadcasting of the subatomic harmonic physics uh, frequencies. So you'd literally split and create non radioactive daughter molecules. Uh, do you think that's theoretically possible based on Tesla's work and some of his statements over 80 years ago? Uh, no, I, I think the damage is already done. No, I'm talking about uh, if the existing molecules. In other words, if you got strontium-90, strontium cesium-134 and 137, could you clear the water by broadcasting a harmonic frequency that would split into non-radioactive daughters? Because that would be the ultimate way to cleanse it, not just filtering it and having the organisms die and fall in the bottom of the ocean and create a radioactive layer, but actually modifying the radioisotopes to make them non-radioactive daughters. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there again, how far is that going to penetrate into the water? Uh, no, my my <clears throat> belief is that the damage uh, is already done. It's already in the food chain, and it's already killing. It's already moving up the food chain. Yeah. It's already been but filtered. It's, but it's, it, it's an open wound. It's, it's a, yeah. In other words, if you had that technology, it's just using our imagination. You'd have to have it on continuously for centuries. Plus, you'd have to actually stop the original source. Um, you know, yeah. we used our, I used my imagination over the last few years trying to, to make some ideas as to what they could do. Firstly, they need to use radiation-proof robots with the ferromagnetic chip that Atmel makes, cable robots with depleted uranium cables or fiber optic cables to operate at a distance so they can get into these plants and start taking care of things. Uh, turning um, the whole area into what I call a crystalline, chlorinated uh, crystal sarcophagus rather than trying to remove these fuel rod assembly bundles because I think they're likely when they get more and more bent ones they're going to cause a pyrophoric fire or when the seal, the seal breaks on these cooling pools and they start to leak and then they go hot. And we have pretty good evidence now also that recently there's heavy isotopes showing up that uh, there's been critical reactions deep in the ground in the aquarium because they have no idea where it is and they don't use ground penetrating radar. So it's like the Keystone Cops, isn't it? It's pretty bad. Oh, yeah. Chinese, Chinese fire drill, not to in practice. <laughs> well, but, no, these are scary things, but we want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Uh, I tell people uh, Fukushima is survivable, but you need your Nutrimeds. You need to have uh, treat your home and your business as a hazmat site. You need to realize the airborne plagues are coming. You need to realize 2014 can be scary, but if you're prepared, it'll be fine. And uh, the brilliance of Professor McCanny and Morrison, our team, trying to give you the best questions to say we don't always give you the best all the answers but we may help you ask much better questions thank you Ann. thank you john and, and professor mccanny we will be back uh, with a full show uh, a week after christmas